Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 253, I chat with industry consultant Pete Putman about various display interfaces and where we're going. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Home Theater Geeks is provided by Cashfly at C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded April 23rd, 2015. Episode 253, Making the Right Connections. This episode of Home Theater Geeks is brought to you by Casper, an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the price because everyone deserves a great night's sleep. Get $50 off any mattress purchase by visiting casper.com slash HTG and enter the promo code HTG. Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the home theater geek and editor of avsforum.com. This week's guest geek is Pete Putman, a longtime industry consultant and president of his own company, Rome Consulting. Hey, Pete, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me over. So glad to have you here. I've been waiting for years, actually, to get you on the show because you are a font of knowledge, as we will learn today. Before we get into it, let me uh, make sure that everybody understands that those who are watching live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions for Pete as we go, and I will pass along as many as I can. So today we wanted, I wanted to talk with you about display interfaces. Not necessarily the sexiest of topics, but critical for getting the content that we want to the display that we want to watch it on. So, and there's lots of stuff going on these days uh, that affects interfaces and interfaces, how they affect what we're going to be able to see. You sent me a a PowerPoint presentation that you've used before with a subtitle that I was kind of curious about in Latin. Uh, uh, Minor io velocior densiora. What the heck does that mean? Well, according to Wikipedia, that means (laughs) smaller, faster, denser. So, Ah. uh, but that's really a good way to think of what's happening to display interfaces these days. They're becoming smaller. They're becoming a lot faster. And by denser, I mean they're carrying multiple signal types, some as diverse as serial data to control devices, high-resolution audio, Ethernet, USB, uh, PCI Express, you name it. It can all be packed into one interface now with as little as five pins. With as little as five pins. As little as five pins. You know, it's funny because I, in the old days, in the old days that you and I both remember, I'm sure... Uh, we had um, analog connections, and each of the connectors on the back of a TV or most devices had a single purpose. And as you just said, nowadays we have connections with multiple purposes that carry multiple streams of information. Um, and I was under the impression that HDMI was going to be the savior of us all, that one cable was going to connect one device to the next and all would be well and we wouldn't have to worry anymore. And yet here we here comes a plethora of, of new and different connections. Uh, and HDMI, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, doesn't seem to really have the bandwidth necessary for everything that we want to do. Um, and yet it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Is there any chance, let me start with this, is there any chance for any of these other interfaces that in fact probably might do better to even get in, get their foot in the door? Well, some already have. Um, As you know, HDMI is a, uh, they will tell you, an interface developed by the HDMI consortium, but uh, the uh, primary uh, design of it, it was based on uh, work done at Silicon Image which is now owned by Lattice Semiconductor in Oregon. Uh, they, they bought the company, I guess, completed the sale about a month ago. And uh, HDMI, which has been around since 2002, was originally developed to be basically DVI with embedded audio. DVI, originally in the DVI spec, there was no embedded audio. And they were looking for a simpler connector. They didn't have to screw in. The average customer could take their brand new Blu-ray player, plug it into a television, sit down, and the thing would work. 
It will automatically configure itself to the correct resolution. They just put a disk in and play it. Since then, uh, there's hundreds of millions of HDMI connectors that have been installed around the world and everything from smartphones and tablets to camcorders, uh, still cameras, uh, set-top boxes. Uh, in the commercial AV world, where I, where I do most of my work nowadays, we have matrix switchers. We have matrix switchers as big as 128 by 128 that can switch HDMI. We have distribution amplifiers. We can take HDMI and we can convert it to a digital signal and switch it over structured wire like Category 6 cable. And we can also send it over fiber optics. So it is absolutely a, a bedrock interface. Um, but again, it was really designed to either connect a media device to a TV or to connect a media device through an AV receiver and then onto a TV. It really wasn't intended to connect into a matrix switcher, a routing switcher, and be sent to any one of 64 different locations. So it's been a little bit problematic for people in the commercial AV world to work with. So, but it is by far and away and clearly a consumer standard. Now, in the world of computers, in the world of IT, we have another interface, which is DisplayPort. And DisplayPort was a little late to the game, came by about four years after HDMI. But DisplayPort was intended to be a digital replacement for the VGA connector, which by my accounting is about 28 years old, and you'll still see it on products. It's amazing it's lasted that long. So the idea and that's was... Even, that's even an analog connection, right? It is. It is an analog connection, although some parts of VGA have, have carried forward into HDMI, such as extended display identification data, EDID, which when you plug a display into a VGA connection on a computer, the computer video card reads the information on how to set up the display, reads the supported resolutions, reads the supported refresh rates and color spaces. So it's a form of automatic communication that ensures a plug-and-play connection. So uh, VISA, the Video Electronic Standards Association, uh, had worked on uh, dis developing DisplayPort. And we're in currently in version 1.2, although 1.3 was announced last year. And this, again, is supposed to replace the VGA connector because obviously it's bandwidth limited and it's analog. So DisplayPort, unlike HDMI, uses a purely packet structure. It's digital packets. HDMI uses something called transition minimized differential signaling, which is in, in itself is a way of compressing a signal to allow it to uh, flow with very low voltage. So HDMI and its offshoots, which we'll learn about today, things like MHL um, and uh, micro HDMI and the new super MHL format are all based on TMDS. DisplayPort and its offshoots, mini DisplayPort, uh, are based on packets. So it's 100% packet structure. Well, when you packetize everything, it's like putting a whole bunch of different envelopes in the mail. The mail carrier can carry them all at the same time. They could be addressed to different people. So you can packetize video, audio, metadata, control signals, uh, high-speed data, things like Thunderbolt, which runs on a DisplayPort interface. So the idea being that DisplayPort would probably be designed for computing devices and HDMI would continue to be for consumer products, but there are far fewer DisplayPort interfaces available commercially on products than there are um, HDMI interfaces. In fact, the notebook computer I'm talking to you on right now is about a five or six-year-old Toshiba satellite, and on the side is an HDMI connection. And yet I noticed if you buy a new Lenovo computer, they seem that most of the new Lenovo laptops use DisplayPort exclusively. So we have two different approaches to the same problem, which is making a digital display connection and being able to multiplex signals through it. And, and both of these are getting faster. But um, I would say at the moment, HDMI is the more speed challenge. Yes. Now, you, you mentioned that the DisplayPort is entirely packetized. I, I assume from that that HDMI is not? Correct. HDMI is not packetized. The only format in which HDMI is packetized is something called HD Base T, which was developed originally for the consumer market, but has been widely adopted in the professional market. HD Base T can carry video, high resolution video, audio, including anything in the HDMI standard, uh, RS-232 commands, which are easy to do, that's low bit rate serial data, infrared, which again is very low bit rate serial data, that's easy to convert, and, and USB. And infra by, by infrared, you mean infrared uh, commands from like a remote. Exactly. They just be converted to pulses and travel as packets and then converted right. back at the other end. So in HD base T, all that information is brought in, converted to a pure digital packet stream, and at the receiver, it's converted back into its original format. And you can also uh, carry Ethernet signals with that as well. Got it. Uh, Blue Rules, uh, and a couple people here in the chat room are asking, uh, basically, any thoughts on HDMI future? Uh, Blue Rules asks, how, how much longer will HDMI be around? 
Uh, as people who watch this show know, Joe Kane, for example, see, is pretty disappointed with HDMI 2.0 and its bandwidth limitation, which you just alluded to. Whereas Mike Heiss, uh, a member of our community who you know undoubtedly, says HDMI is here and it won. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that it won. Um, the problem with HDMI 2.0, and by the way, I share Joe's concerns on this, it isn't fast enough. And we never want to be in a position where the limiting factor in a, in a uh, ecosystem for delivering content is the display interface. Um, I'm actually working on a uh, white paper right now on what I call the 4K reality check. And the idea is that everybody's talking about 4K in both commercial and, and consumer spaces, but it's like flying a plane while you're building it. Not all the pieces are in place yet. Things like right. high dynamic range, high frame rate, wider color gamuts, all these tricks that will come with ultra high definition imaging, 4K, 5K. We now have 5K 27-inch computer monitors. We have 5K TVs. We have 8K panels available. So you don't want the display interface to say, well, you know what? It's great that you just bought a new Ferrari, but you can only drive at 60 miles an hour. I mean, that's <laughs> ridiculous. You want to be able to say, great, you bought a Ferrari. I built the road just for you, and you can go 200 miles an hour if you feel like it, and you'll still be able to go faster than that. So... Uh, the problem with HDMI 2.0, which, by the way, is still not widely implemented, almost a year and a half that was introduced, is that its capped bit rate is 18 gigabits a second. But if you do some basic math, if you take a uh, Ultra HD signal, for example, with a standard blanking interval, and you want to deliver 60 hertz Ultra HD with 10-bit color, and you've hung around out in Hollywood long enough to, I'm sure, have heard at Simpty and others that we're all coming to the conclusion that you need to have 10-bit color sampling, not 8-bit color rendering, rather. Yes, 10-bit minimum to do 4K, especially if you want to do HDR. In 2020, you might even need to move to 12-bit. Well, the minute you go to 10-bit, RGB through HDMI, 60 hertz, Ultra HD, can't pass it. It's not fast enough. It's, you, you just hit a wall. You can yep. do it with, this, with DisplayPort, the current version of it, which is why, oddly enough, I noticed on some TVs now, they're actually putting DisplayPort connections on them. Not a lot. But yes, they've put them on there. And when you ask, they'll say, well, that's for the gamers. That's the guys running computers. So if you're forward thinking about an interface, you're looking down the pike and saying, okay, here's where the industry is now. Here's where it's going in the next year. But where is it going to go after that? I don't want me to be the choke point. I want my yep. interface to be faster than anything that's available for a while. And it's not. It's, it's not fast enough. Exactly. Quixton UK asks, will DisplayPort be on the next, will be on TVs? And you just mentioned that it already is on some Panasonic models. Are there any other companies that are putting DisplayPort on their TVs? Well, I don't want to uh, say specifically because I know that some manufacturers are, I guess, experimenting with it. Um, but Panasonic, you're correct. Panasonic does have DisplayPort inputs on their televisions. It's very one, one very important distinction to note between HDMI and DisplayPort. Uh, Every HDMI port that you as a manufacturer install, whether it's a receiver port or a transmitter port, you pay a royalty to the owner of the intellectual property, which is HDMI licensing LLC, which of course now is owned by Lattice Semiconductor. If you install DisplayPort, there's no royalty associated with it. And there's over 40 patents that have uh, come out of the, dis of the DisplayPort design process. But for the time being, uh, Visa has decided not to charge any royalties for use of DisplayPort. So if you want to build DisplayPort receivers and transmitters into your products, you're welcome to do so. I think the reason they do that, obviously, is they want to see more adoption of the, uh, of the interface. And that's certainly one way to do it. And again, if you look at the new Lenovo laptops, I have a customer who all of their uh, employees now have Lenovo's and every single one of them, the only output connection is DisplayPort. Hmm. <clears throat> um, the, other, the other issue with HDMI, one other issue that I have... Um, tried to get my brain around, is we now have HDMI 2.0, which, as you say, tops out at 18 gigabits per second. It, ideally, some, some HDMI 2.0 ports are still at, at the previous speed of 10.2 gigabits per second. And how do you know what, what you're getting? Uh, and then there's the issue of HDCP, which is uh, uh, high-definition copy protection. Uh, and the current standard... The previous standard, I think, was 1.4, I don't remember. Now it's 2.2, and that's going to be needed for Ultra HD Blu-ray and probably other source devices, set-top boxes and so on. And up until recently, you couldn't have HDMI 2.0 even at 18 gigabits per second along with HDCP 2.2. At CES this year, 
we we saw a demonstration of how that is now starting to come into the market. But as you say, uh, you know, the rollout of HDMI 2.0 is it's one and a half years old or so now, and it's still not fully implemented in the market. Correct. And and actually a wild card popped up at CES and I have to admit I didn't see this coming. Uh, Super MHL. Uh, uh, your more astute uh, members of your community will know that MHL stands for Mobile High Definition Link. And if you have a uh, any Samsung smartphone, uh, say from the Series 4 on Galaxy or Galaxy tablet or something, you have MHL in there. MHL is simply HDMI running over the micro USB port. So they can do HDMI uh, 1.4. It's compatible with 1.4 running over USB, uh, micro USB connectors, um, which is pretty cool. But the problem with the thinking about MHL is it's highly unlikely that somebody that wants to play back a video from a tablet or a phone is going to run a, run a cable from their phone to their television. It, mm. it doesn't make sense. It's counterintuitive. So this year, and I will be the first to admit, I was caught completely off guard by this. Uh, the MHL consortium introduced Super MHL. And Super, Super MHL to me was almost an oxymoron because MHL is mobile, high definition link. And the I sent you a picture of the connector before. The Super MHL connector is anything but mobile. It's a 32 pin connector about the size of an HDMI connector. What's right, intriguing about it? You have a picture yes. of it there. Oh, no, that's well, uh, that's that's MHL on the bottom. That's correct, and a full size HDMI on the top. Um, there's Super MHL. Now, if you notice, this connector is, is actually about the size, if not a little bit larger, than a standard HDMI connector. And it's 32 pins. It has a maximum bit rate of 32 gigabits a second. I mean, it blows by HDMI 2.0, but it uses the same principle for signaling, transition minimized differential signaling. The connector is symmetrical. HDMI is not. If you are fumbling around and you can't figure out which way to plug this connector in, it doesn't matter. It'll plug in right side up. There is no right side up or upside down. It'll just plug in. And with Super MHL, along with some other connectors I hope to talk about in a minute, it configures itself. So the interface will configure the pins accordingly and make the connection. It also supports a really interesting new thing called display stream compression. Uh, for the first time now, we can actually apply light compression to the display signal. That's never happened before. And DisplayPort 1.3 and Super MHL both support display stream compression. But back to Super MHL. So if you compare HDMI 2.0 to Super MHL, they both use TMDS. Super MHL is a 32 gigabit a second maximum data rate. HDMI 2.0 is only 18. HDMI is not a symmetrical connector. Super MHL is. You can apply compression to Super MHL. Um, as far as I know, unless the standard's being updated, you can't do that with HDMI 2.0 yet. So you'd have to ask yourself, since uh, MHL and HDMI have the same parent technology, TMDS, why not just chuck one and keep the other? And indeed, in some press briefings at Super MHL, uh, the MHL consortium has done, they talk about TVs having one Super MHL input for 8K. For some reason, they're obsessed with 8K right now. I'm not sure why. Um, and then they'd say maybe the rest would be HDMI 2.0. And I said, I would just have four Super MHL inputs on there. I mean, why not, why not put the fastest interface that you can possibly put on there? It's TMDS. And of course, you can buy some sort of a in-between series adapter uh, to convert the connector, physical connection of the connector. But the signaling format is still TMDS. So this really confuses people. And I like to explain Super MHL. Uh, think of it this way. The, the kids down the street that, you know, used to, race around in their small cars and everything in annoy you. Well, they come out one day and they've got a Pinto jacked up eight feet above the ground with Caterpillar truck drivers on it and a Ford V8 shoved in the front. That's what Super <laughs> MHL is. That's really what it is. It's, it's like the mobile interface gone crazy. It also supports the new USB type C alternate mode, which means you can have USB 3.0 data and high resolution video and audio running at the same time through the same symmetrical self-configuring connector. So yeah. it, 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 to me, that's where this industry is heading. Connectors that can accommodate compression, doesn't matter which way you plug them in, they configure themselves, they're very smart. Both of those, by the way, support HDCP 2.2. Um, so, you know, to me, that's, that's the future. You know, either of those interfaces will get you above 30 gigabits a second, which for the time being will keep you in, in uh, you can be rolling in 4K, 10-bit, 12-bit color, 60 hertz, whatever you want to do. Uh, because now you can compress, now you have display stream. You mentioned HDCP 2.2. I know I've jumped around a little bit. You're absolutely right. There's going to be a problem with that. It's not backward compatible with version 1.3 slash 1.4. Um, HDCP 2.2 is looking for a valid key exchange in 20 milliseconds. And if it doesn't get it, it'll just shut the interface down. And you'll have to hot plug it again to activate it. 
those of you who've had problems with HDCP reading before know that you'll get this kind of like digital noise on the screen that the picture will flash about every second, second and a half, and then go back to digital noise because it can't find a connection. But with HDMI 2.2, it'll look, doesn't find it, kaboom, it's off. So uh, HDCP 2.2. Correct, HDCP yeah. 2.2. And uh, again, that is supported by Super MHL, and it's also supported by HDMI 2.0, and it's supported by DisplayPort 1.3. All, th all three of those will support HDCP 2.2. Hmm. You were mentioning um, compression along the connection, and Floop in the chat room asks, uh, TVs generally have some smarts. Wouldn't, how about sending an already encoded signal, like H.264, H.265, to the TV for decoding? Wouldn't that save a lot of bandwidth? Well, actually, that's a really smart idea, and that's actually where everything is headed, ultimately, uh, to do a direct video over IP connection into the TV set and eliminate the display connection altogether. The problem with that approach is that what if you want to connect a peripheral device? What if you want to bring a wireless high bandwidth signal in from a tablet or a phone? Uh, you could do that over Wi-Fi, but you practically, practically speaking, you can't use 2.4 gig Wi-Fi for that. It's just too unpredictable and too erratic. You can use 5 gig, you can use channel bonding, or even better yet, you could use 60 gig, which is really where all of this should go because the channels are 2 gigahertz wide. Uh, so it would be very, very easy to stream a 4K over a 60 gig connection to a TV. But as far as making a connection, a high bandwidth connection, sure, you could go directly in using video over IP with H.265 HEVC encoding, which nominally for, say, Quad HD, 24 frame a second, 30 frame a second, you need to be around 15 megabits a second. That was about the average speed I saw at the NAB demos last week for doing Quad HD. It was between as low as 10 for some live action stuff, but mostly around 15 megabits a second. Then you eliminate the display connection altogether, and you don't have the copy protection issues because you assume that that's all done inside the TV itself. That's where the exchange is made. Right, right. Um, <clears throat> uh, SSB201 asks, so do we? how about moving to fiber optics instead of electronics? Well, I guess you, that's you'd have to have you have to have electronics at the at one end or the other anyway, right? Well, you do. I mean, that's just modulated light. So modulated light by itself isn't going to do the job for you. Uh, you have to be able to translate the light pulses back into something else. In the commercial AV industry, we can already do HDMI uh, digitally. We can digitize it and run it over fiber optics. We can do DisplayPort over fiber optics. At NAB, Corning was showing 100 foot long. A multi-mode fiber cable assemblies with mini display port connectors on it and power at one end uh, to power the uh, LED lasers so or LED, LED uh, light emitters so yeah it's very easy to do fiber optics would be a great way to go it's just that uh, in some industries there's a little bit of phobia about using fiber optics there's some misperceptions that it's too difficult to work with the connectors are too hard to put on takes too long it's too expensive truth is multi-mode fiber is actually cheaper than structured wire right now in uh, in hmm. bulk so and there are, Corning makes crimp on, no polish, no epoxy connectors that if you're used to using these things, you can crimp them almost as fast as you can crimp a BNC connector. But yes, uh, ideally, in a perfect world, optical fiber with packets, 100% packet transmission system, whether it's something like DisplayPort or direct video over IP, that would be the way to go. And that then bandwidth doesn't become an issue anymore. Uh, Web6465 asks, I have a cable that is DisplayPort on one end and HDMI on the other. How well do they play together? Well, very interesting about that. The DisplayPort specification supports, I believe, 11, it's 9 or 11 physical layers, including native fiber optics and wireless. But built into the DisplayPort specification is phantom power. So on the DisplayPort terminals, there's about 3.3 to 3.5 volts at half an amp, 500 milliampers, DC power available. So when you buy a DisplayPort to HDMI converter, it's really easy to do. You put the chip right in the converter, the power is supplied by the DisplayPort connection. So those things actually work really well. You're converting the packets to a TMDS signal. It's very difficult to go back in the other direction because there's no support for power in the HDMI, uh, HDMI world. There is on two of the pins, uh, five volts at very low current, uh, basically transistor transistor logic we used to call it in the old days TTL and all that does that's a logic line that sits high or low and when you plug it in it toggles high or low and it tells your computer that a display is connected that's all so that reads the EDID table but there's not enough juice in there to be able to run a converter so you require a much larger box uh, to convert from HDMI back to DisplayPort but DisplayPort to HDMI is a piece of cake 
Hmm. Okay. Uh, Creamy Corn Cob is asking, so HDMI 2.0 is dead already if it's hit if if we've hit the wall already, or do you think that it will increase its bandwidth uh, moving forward? Well, it could. Um, I think what happened with HDMI 2.0, if you have to follow my reasoning here, is they were looking at things like Blu-ray. They were looking at the broadcast world. Right now, the broadcast world largely uses 8-bit color. And you can, uh, you can do with HDMI 2.0, you can do 60 hertz, quad HD, 8-bit color, RGB. Not a problem. It'll pass that. And they were probably thinking of Blu-ray, the new HD uh, or UHD Blu-ray standard. You know, oh, that'll probably be 8-bit color too. But as we just discussed a minute ago, 8-bit color, and some of us even joke about it, should be outlawed when it comes to yes. Ultra HD because it's just not up to the job anymore. 16.7 million colors. You will see color gradients. You'll see contours. You have to have 10-bit color. So, um, but, but again, when you start to have this argument about, well, should we move from HDMI 2.0? Should we go to a higher bit rate within the standard? Well, here come the kids with their monster truck. They've already done it. So here's a TMDS system that's way faster and it's got all the improvements that HDMI 2.0 doesn't have and it gives you the bit rate that you didn't have before. It gives you compression, which you didn't have, plus you can multiply signals on it. But when you try to have a conversation with the two parts of the company, you kind of get stonewalled or blank stares like, well, nobody wants to pick a winner or a loser. But from my perspective, it makes no sense to support both formats. There's so few HDMI 2.0 interfaces that have been implemented now at this point, you might as well throw your money behind Super MHL and say, hey, now I'm, now I'm future-proof. Now it doesn't matter what you put in to my connected display. I will be able to handle the signal. Will, will Super MHL handle um, legacy inputs? I mean, can, I assume you can convert from HDMI to Super MHL, so current products that have HDMI outputs uh, would be able to go into that Super MHL input no problem, right? Yeah, I would suspect that's the case because, again, the underlying system is transition minimized differential signaling. So it shouldn't make any difference. Yeah. It's exactly the same system. It may be pin conversions. It may be voltage level conversions for some of the other interfaces. But no, I, I would imagine that it, it shouldn't be difficult to take an older product, plug it into Super MHL and have it work correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, Web8348 in the chat room asks, how much latency is introduced in packetized video and what which interconnects offer the lowest latency? Latency um, is really more a function of forward error correction. Um, you have to buffer to allow for drop packets. Uh, we're assuming that in a display port connection that uh, you have basically a lossless packetized system. You're not going to have an issue uh, with drop packets. Um, it's going to be adequately, uh, the latency is very, very low. I can't give you a specific number if you'd like. You can go on. A visa and go to the display port specifications, at least in the FAQs, and they give you some idea of what that is. But uh, it would be basically the same for either HDMI or display port. It's very, very low latency interface. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Heiss in the chat room is saying, I think the reality is that uh, what is Super MHL now will, will uh, what ends up being HDMI 3. Uh, since they're both eventually owned by the same company and the chips will come from the same two or three places. What do you think? Oh, that makes perfect sense. That's what I would do. Like I said a minute ago, uh, during a press conference or a, like a phone chat with the people at the MHL Consortium, when they said, we imagine a TV in the not-too-distant future with three HDMI 2.0 inputs and one Super MHL input, I said to them, why don't you just make them all Super MHL? Why, mm -hmm. why would I want a slower input? I mean, what if I want to connect two devices that require, let's say, uh, I'm doing high dynamic range, 10-bit uh, off of a uh, media player, uh, and let's say I want to connect a high-resolution computing system, and I need to go through that second input. Well, then I'm stuck. So why not just make them all Super MHL? I don't really have in any insight into that. I, again, I was just as surprised as anybody else to see Super MHL. I had no inkling that they were going to announce it, but it's, it's clearly uh, the choice between, you know, like a nice sports car and a Porsche. It's like, well, <laughs> who would want, want the Porsche, you know, especially yeah. if the incremental cost is slightly higher. So uh, I've been told by the MHL consortium that they, they have some design wins and we are going to see products showing up pretty soon with Super MHL on them. Uh, it does obviously connect, uh, create headaches for uh, manufacturers of HDMI distribution and switching equipment who are probably ready to shoot themselves at this point because they're like, well, okay, HDMI 2.0 is here. We're making our backplanes faster for switching and everything else. Uh-oh, now there's Super MHL. Should we continue to plan for HDMI 2.0 or should maybe we look at a faster interface? 
And of course, there's always DisplayPort, you know, that more and more people are using that on computers now because that's also gotten faster. So it's a very unsettled landscape right now. All we know for a fact is that if we are talking about being able to really push the envelope, and I'll, and let's leave Quad HD for a moment and look at another resolution, why? But if we're going to push the, en the envelope, we know we have two different systems, not compatible with each other, but they're certainly fast enough to do it. Example I'm going to use, and I think I, I included that in my uh, PowerPoint deck I sent you, are these new 27-inch uh, high-resolution computer monitors, super wide screen, that um, I believe are coming out of the LG Display Factory, but Dell is selling them, HP is selling them. 5120 horizontal pixels by 2880 vertical pixels. Well, that's coming off a computer workstation, so it's going to be RGB color, and it's probably going to be high frame rate. You need two display port connections now just to make that work. Wow. So it isn't just, isn't just the TVs that are affected by this. It's also uh, computer and workstation displays that are being affected by this too. So the manufacturers are scratching their heads like, well, which interface do we go with? Do we support both? Do we support one? If we support one, which one do we pick? Yeah, it's a tr it's a troubling thing for them certainly, and for us because we don't know as consumers, you know, because it's it's un unknown what the future holds. I, I come back all, always to HDMI is so entrenched, um, just as a physical connector, much less a an interface. Uh, do you think that it's possible for Super MHL or D DisplayPort uh, to to supersede it to end up being the dominant? connector in the industry? And if so, how long would that take to make that transition? Well, um, a couple things to take in consideration here. Number one, HDMI 1.4, which is still a very, very commonly used interface, 1.3.1.4, has a maximum bit rate of 10.2 gigabits a second. We already know that that can pass quad HD uh, with a bit color. It's not a problem at 24 hertz. At 24 and, uh, hertz. Yeah. Correct. And uh, so if you come into a TV at 24 hertz, the TV is going to do the 3-2 conversion and yank it up to 60 hertz for refresh. So uh, in the commercial AV industry, we have manufacturers now saying their products are 4K ready or they're 4K certified and all that simply because they can support quad HD, 24 hertz or 30 hertz with 8-bit color. So which, I've not really which I've always thought was pretty deceptive. You know, they say HDMI 2.0 ready for 4K and yet it's very limited what it can do. Also, the color subsampling, I believe, is limited to 420. Correct. That's right. But again, they're basing that on what is the most common color subsampling format that's used for broadcast, for cable, for satellite, for streaming. For, for Blu-ray. For Blu-ray, correct. It's 420, 8-bit color. And right. I think when, when 2.0 was designed, they were looking at 420, 8-bit color. Although, if you do the calculations, you can actually do RGB, 8-bit color. But again... We're having this discussion about 10-bit 10 uh, rendering, 10-bit delivery of content. We now are starting to see 10-bit true, 10-bit addressable display panels coming out of fabs in Asia. So remember the old days with plasma, 6-bit panels, they contoured like crazy. Then 8-bit yep. became the standard. Well, now we have 10-bit panels that are coming out. So why not drive a 10-bit panel with 10-bit per pixel color sampling? But, you know, it makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. I don't think HDMI as an interface is threatened anytime soon because it's still way early in the 4K game. I mean, we don't have a lot of 4K content available. Um, and again, what's being delivered, for the most part, can run through an HDMI 1.4, 1.3 interface. But a year from now, that entire landscape could change considerably. And I expect it will could change because I did not expect to see these 5K monitors. I think the HP one is under $1,000. That's dirt cheap. So... As the cheap, high-resolution glass uh, comes to market, then we have to start building faster interfaces because whereas you might be happy with 420 color off optical disc coming into a 10-bit 420 color, uh, the guy that's there doing some really heavy-duty, serious gaming is not going to be happy with that. They're going to want to run in the RGB domain. A person that's doing virtual reality, somebody that's doing geophysical uh, exploration, they're, they, they use a lot of really sophisticated 3D imaging for example, when they're uh, drilling for oil and things to imagine what it looks like, that stuff's all in the RGB domain. So if they're doing high resolution imaging and they're coming out RGB and they want to do high frame rate, bang, they're up against that roadblock again. So it's, I think the display manufacturers right now are kind of sitting there thinking, well, what's the market going to ask for? If it's a television, you're probably safe if you put one HDMI 2.0 input on it and three of the 1.4 inputs. But if you're forward thinking, you probably should add a display port input to it, at least the current version. Because then you can say to somebody, well, you can do 10-bit gaming through this thing. It's fast enough to support that. 
But down the road, do you support display stream? Do you support Super MHL? Do you add a Super MHL connection and go to HDMI 2.0? Do you put more display port connectors on there? I can't really speak for the manufacturers. I don't know what's going through their minds right now, but I can tell you a lot of them are looking at this very seriously and they're looking at DisplayPort and saying, well, the nice thing about that is I don't have to pay anybody to use it. I can just go ahead and buy the chipsets and install it. There's no royalty. But right. who's going to connect stuff to it? What about Super MHL? Does that have royalties? Uh, I would assume it does. Again, being TMDS, it would be exactly the same as uh, HDMI. And that's really up to Lattice Semiconductor. I mean, at this point, you know, Lattice bought the assets of Silicon Image, so I would assume that HDMI licensing LLC is still in operation and they're still going to collect a royalty for every one of those connectors that's on any device from your smartphone to a television. Why would you, why would you cut off that revenue stream? It's a, it's a mm. format people have to support. So Super MHL, yes, as far as I know, there will be a royalty associated with it. Mm. Well, before we continue, uh, and this is, boy, we're getting into some pretty uh, geeky stuff here, but after all, it's Home Theater Geeks. Uh, take me, let me take a moment to thank our sponsor for this episode, which is Casper. Now, Casper is a new sponsor for Home Theater Geeks, and we welcome them to the show. Casper is an online retailer of premium mattresses for a fraction of the cost that you would spend on just about any other mattress. Casper is revolutionizing the mattress industry by cutting the cost of dealing with resellers and showrooms and passing that savings directly on to the consumer. Now, the Casper mattress is obsessively engineered at a fair price, and this is an important point to make. Uh, there are two technologies that are at the core of these mattresses, latex and memory foam, come together for better nights and brighter days. It's a comfortable mattress that has just the right amount of sink and bounce. Uh, it, it provides long-lasting comfort and support, and you can buy it easily online and completely risk-free. Very important here. Casper understands the importance of trying out a mattress. You can try sleeping on one today because they offer free delivery and painless returns with a 100-day trial period so you don't have to lie down on one in a showroom. Did you know that statistically, lying on a bed in a showroom has no correlation whatsoever to whether it's the right bed for you? I know I've experienced this before. Casper's mattresses are also made in the USA, which is very cool and uh, something worth supporting, if you ask me. Uh, you can get a Casper mattress, 500 bucks for a twin or $950 for a king size. That's really, really good. Believe me, I know. Compared to industry averages, it's outstanding. And you can save an additional 50 bucks as one of our audience members by going to casper.com slash HTG and entering the promo code HTG. That's casper.com slash HTG with the promo code HTG. And we thank Casper very much for their support of Home Theater Geeks. Um, we don't want to go to sleep right now, however, because we are talking with Pete Putman, uh, industry consultant, president of Rome Consulting, and uh, a font of knowledge, as I said at the beginning, about many things in this industry. And what we're talking about today are display interfaces. Um, and uh, what I wanted to ask you about, Pete, was uh, the wireless connections. You, you mentioned them earlier, and I'd, I'd like to spend a little more time on that. Uh, we basically have two uh, video wireless connections that are used today. One is in the 5 gigahertz range, which can actually go through walls, depending on the wall. And 60 gigahertz, which was developed by a company called Cybeam, called YHD, W-I-H-D. And at 60 gigahertz, uh, it can't go through walls. It's only for within one room. Uh, but you mentioned earlier that you thought that was the way to go. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about each of these uh, types of wireless video interfaces? Sure. Well, there's actually three. Uh, the first one that's most common, if you go to a place like Best Buy, Fry's, you know, one of those chains, you'll see these uh, wireless uh, video transmitter receiver kits. They just basically run on TCP IP networks, a standard internet through your house. Uh, so like they're not. 
Exactly. They're not very reliable. They don't use a, a true video streaming protocol like RTTP or RTMP. So they're kind of operating under the premise that as long as all the pixels in the audio gets there, eventually it'll work. And those are cheap. You can buy those for as little as like $70. Um, I wouldn't recommend them. Uh, they're just not very reliable. Uh, the next step up uh, would be to a proprietary system called WHDI. And WHDI was developed by a company called Amamon Semiconductor and originally developed to do real-time high-resolution imaging of uh, military exercises for the uh, U.S. government. And what it does is it uses the same uh, radio bands as 5 gigahertz, um, let's say 802.11a and AC signals, um, but it does not use TCP IP. It does have some form of real-time transmission protocol, and it was designed to operate so if the channel gets very noisy or the signal's weak, it will start to sacrifice color bits, but it'll preserve luminance bits. So if you stream from it, and you're some distance from the receiver and you put it on a really big screen to look at it. Sometimes you'll see a little tiny bit of sparkle in there. But it works. It'll do anything HDMI will do, HDMI 1314. So if you have embedded audio, it'll transmit the embedded audio. If you have uh, embedded multi-channel audio, it'll pass that too. Um, you know, I have saw, not... I, yeah. I'm so sorry for interrupting. I, um, uh, I've talked with the Amimon folks at CES and various trade shows. And they claim that what they're transmitting is uncompressed video at 1080p or I, when I was talking with them, it was 1080p. Is that true? Is it really uncompressed? Because that seems like an awful lot of data. Well, uncompressed 1080p 60 is about three gigabits a second. They're transmitting ah, okay. 1080p. They're transmitting 1080p 60 in a 40 megahertz channel. So do the math. Okay. Um, obviously, there is some form of compression. Uh, chrominance bits can be sacrificed, luminance bits can be sacrificed, but typically chrominance will, will what they do is they, they format it so that the luminance bits are called more significant bits, most significant bits, and the color is the least significant bits. The idea is to maintain a constant transmission without any dropout or buffering uh, as the signal path varies. But in the home, you obviously don't have the issues that you would have out in the field. So uh, when you hook up an HDMI, a wireless HDMI transmitter receiver kit, they work great. I mean, you can stream stuff from a Blu-ray disc to a TV. Now, the problem uh, with this system is that um, the cables have gotten so cheap now that people will just say, well, I'll just run a longer cable rather yeah. than buy one of these transmitter receiver kits, which you can't argue with that. I mean, the, some of these first kits that came out, when they came out a few years ago, they were $600. Who's going to spend $600 to stream video wirelessly from, let's say, 15 feet or where you're 20 feet away? Just buy a cable. Well, now, except that HDMI cables are limited in their length, right? If you get beyond... 15, 20 feet, uh, you're going to start seeing losses there, sparkles, and eventually the signal's going to uh, drop out altogether. Yeah, well, it depends on the type of cable. I mean, I have some 50-footers that are about the diameter of my finger that actually work pretty well. But, I mean, I wouldn't recommend that as a matter of course without some sort of signal regeneration at the far end. But getting back to wireless, um, there haven't been a lot of these products on the market. And lately, Amamon seems to have shifted its focus away from doing wireless HDMI to doing wireless camera connections. So a lot of the drones that we saw at NAB are using the Amamon technology to stream HD video from a drone to the ground uh, to a receiver. So it works oh, equally that's well. Yes, it works equally well with something like high-definition serial digital interface. It doesn't have to be HDMI. It would even work with DisplayPort if you wanted it to. It's just a way of coding the signal, transmitting it with a real-time protocol built in. Obviously, some compression is happening there, and then reconstructing the signal at the other end. It just so happens that they were playing in the HDMI space. Now, there are some companies commercially that sell wireless HDMI kits, and there's been some very clever applications of these things. Uh, one that uh, I heard about was a fishing boat that goes out on cruises, takes a lot of people on a cruise. And the up in the pilot house, uh, the captain has this large LCD display with multiple screens tiled on it. So he has his wind speed indicator, his temperature indicator, barometer. He's got the radar going. He's got the sonar going. He's got cameras front and aft. So what he does is he hooks it up to an HDMI connection and streams that downstairs to a 65-inch TV that's down in the lounge. Everybody's having drinks and food, and they can watch everything that he's seeing. So that's one application. But it seems that Amamon is more focused right now on the uh, commercial camera market, doing wireless camera streaming, and they see drones as a big opportunity. So you mentioned 60 gig. 60 gigahertz technology actually grew out of some research that was done at University of California, Berkeley, a while ago. There was a lab there called the Wireless uh, Communications Lab, and they were exploring how many things in the home could be converted to wireless. And one of the things they were playing around with was HDMI. Uh, that company eventually went private, 
uh, with some venture capital funding. It was called Cybeam. And uh, they had some really cool products. They were the ones that came out with a $695 wireless HDMI transmission kit for 60 gigahertz. Um, obviously, it was a miserable failure. The company burned through over $100 million in financing and almost went bankrupt. And then they were bought Holy out. By, smoke. Yes, they were. And they were bought out by Silicon Image in 2011 or 2012. I don't remember exactly which year. I think it was 2011 for pennies on the dollar. The company was acquired rather cheaply. So um, Silicon Image rebranded it as YHD, Wireless HD. Uh, if you, I think the website's still active. If you go out and Google Wireless HD, you can get the complete specification. Uh, it supports networking. There's all kinds of cool things you can do with it. This year, for the first time at CES, they rebranded it back to Cybeam. So it's not called Wireless HD anymore. It's now called Cybeam technology. Oh, really? I, I, really didn't, I hadn't heard that. Yes, I went to visit Silicon Image in their booth way back in the back of the South Hall in their meeting room. And all the guys demoing it were wearing shirts that said Cybeam. And uh, their huh. demo was Cybeam. So what they've come up with now is very clever. They've come up with a technology called Snap. And Snap is something where you would have a display interface built into a phone or a tablet. And all you have to do is put it in a dock of some kind by a TV. And there's a very small air gap between the transmitter and receiver and it detects the presence of the device, immediately establishes a connection, and it can stream 12 gigabits a second maximum data off of your connected device into the TV. So if you have videos you want to look at, whatever you want to look at, it's a wireless connection, unlike oh. MHL. Also, it'll do wireless USB, so you can stream data at the same time, and you can also charge your phone. It'll, it'll incorporate wireless charging. So it's called Snap Technology. My guess is that uh, they probably have something on their website to talk about this. But it's um, it's very, very cool. Now, I'll be curious to see if manufacturers will support it. What they're pitching is the idea of, and they say in their video, imagine your life without any connections, which a lot of us would say, thank you, God, because as you can see, it's very confusing right now. But they're talking about making phones and tablets really, really skinny by eliminating the connector altogether, which logically would be the next step in this smaller, faster, denser progression, which is just to eliminate the connector altogether. So um, it's an interesting approach. Uh, I did not see very many demos of MHL this year. You know, plug the cable into the phone and plug the phone into a TV. And by the way, for those who haven't seen one, um, this actually is the uh, Samsung MHL adapter that uh, you plug this into the serial port connector. There's the uh, micro, micro, uh, hold that up a little higher. Yes, I will. Sorry about there that. There you go. No problem. Yeah. That is the micro, uh, serial micro USB five pin. It goes into this little block. The little block requires, uh, right here, power. You have to power this up and then there's your HDMI connection. So huh. yesterday I delivered a talk for the society of cable and telecommunication engineers on this very product or actually this very topic. And I preloaded a copy of Skyfall on my Samsung Galaxy 5 phone, plugged this in, put power on it, ran it into a switcher, and bingo, there was 1080p60. Uh, most of these devices, uh, the video cards default to 1080p60 output from tablets and phones when you connect them to an external display. So, um, so again, but I had to hook this up, put power on this thing. It got a little complicated, and people were like, whoa, why would I do that? I would just connect it with wireless, like voila. That's really what the intent is. So, um, but that's an example. Five pins is carrying, is carrying all those signals. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> why would it need power? I mean, doesn't uh, mini, uh, mini USB have some power on it? Now, obviously, that would drain your phone pretty quick. Well, it requires power because we have the signals are multiplexed. So, remember, coming off of this little connector, we have both uh, USB data... Yep. We have power connections, and we have HDMI. So what happens in the block is those are separated. So the HDMI is broken out to this connector, and then through this connector, uh, your USB and your power travels through as it did before. So we're extending from this to this, but we're extracting that, and that's why you have to have power. Now, if you have an MHL-compatible TV, if you have a Samsung TV, a Sony TV, there may be some LG models that support this. You will often find there's an MHL connector on the back. So you can just run an MHL cable, which basically is like a specialized USB cable directly to your phone, and it will extract the video at the TV, and it'll send power back to your phone at the same time. 
So uh, not only that, not long ago, I bought a Pioneer AV receiver, a new one for my home theater. And I noticed one of the inputs on the Pioneer is MHL. So if I wanted to, I could play Skyfall off my phone through my AV receiver into my home theater. Why I would want to do that, I have no idea, but I could do it. <laughs> but yes, you do have to have power. You have to have power to, to power the chipset that separates the signal. They're combined in the phone, but they have to be separated before you can play HDMI. Um, Got it. There's, there, now, just to point this out, there's not a lot of these out there, but at one time, there was also a connection called micro USB. It's kind of fallen out of favor, but it was widely used on um, Motorola phones, which is Lenovo now. And this is a micro USB connector. And it's a tiny little bugger. You can yeah. see it there. That is a full performance HDMI connector. It does everything HDMI 1.4 does. It'll do 4K, 30, 8-bit uh, color. Um, this happens, the other end of this happens to be an HDMI adapter. But um, at this talk yesterday, I played video off my uh, Droid Razor phone. I don't use it anymore, but it's still working great as a media player. Using the micro HDMI connection and going right into a switcher and up to a, a six-foot diagonal screen. So um, that connector, I think, is going to probably fall by the wayside, as probably this one is. Um, this one was in use for a while. You don't see it much anymore. It's called Mini MHL, or M uh, sorry, Mini HDMI. So this is a slightly smaller version of HDMI. And where you would find these, for a long time, these were used on DSLRs. They were used on point-and-shoot cameras. Uh, I even have a, you remember Optima, I have a little Optima LED projector downstairs. There's a mini HDMI connector on it. So, again, exact same specifications as the full-size HDMI connector. Right. But it appears that both micro and mini are falling by the wayside. More people are just moving to full-size HDMI or they're using something like MHL. Mm -hmm. Well, that brings up the question of, I mean, you, you've connected your phone with, uh, with uh, MHL or one of these other uh, connections by wire to a, to a display. But you mentioned at the beginning of the show that really what the ultimate goal is, is to be able to stream wirelessly from your phone. If you want to use your phone as a source device to play Skyfall or whatever, uh, don't you ideally want that to be wireless? You don't want to have to be fiddling with cables. Uh, is, is there any... I mean, will this 5 gigahertz um, or 60 gigahertz be uh, wireless solutions that we were talking about ever be implemented in portable devices to be able to use them as source devices wirelessly? Well, that's an excellent question. The problem with putting anything in consumer electronics is you know how cheap consumer electronics are in general. Yep. Um, let's start with televisions. Television prices are just absolutely rock bottom, and there's no indication that they're going to ever recover. They're just going to continue to get lower and lower. So TV manufacturers are loath to add anything to a television that adds substantial cost to it. They mm. might say to a manufacturer, we like the snap technology. We'd like to offer that to a consumer where they can have a little HDMI cable that comes out to a dock, and they can put their phone in the dock. But that can't add more than, let's say, a dollar to the cost of a television or maybe $2 to the cost of a television because – you know, the profit margins are so squeezed on televisions now, uh, they're loath to do that. Wi-Fi can be added to a TV relatively inexpensively. I mean, there's really not an intellectual property issue there. You have to support the standard. But the problem with Wi-Fi is that you're streaming video over TCP IP connection, and TCP IP is not a real-time protocol. It's a, eventually it all gets there protocol. If you add a lot of latency to it, it works pretty well. I mean, we stream Netflix into our TVs, and it seems to work pretty well. And a lot of TVs, a lot of TVs do have Wi-Fi capabilities. You can connect them wirelessly to your network to, to be able to stream Netflix. But I must admit, I've never found it to work all that well. Yes, uh, generally, when we were just watching House of Cards last night, I mean, if you're gonna, if you really want to stream reliably, use a wired connection. Don't use wireless. Uh, you don't realize it at night. You know, gee, why is the connection slowing down? Well, look at all the devices that are on while you're watching TV. My Wi-Fi are watching. We have the TV on. That's got Wi-Fi in it. Um, a TiVo unit that's got Wi-Fi. A Channel Master DVR Plus with Wi-Fi. Comcast Cable Box has Wi-Fi. Both our phones have Wi-Fi. Both our tablets have Wi-Fi. And mm. plus, we have other stuff in the house with Wi-Fi. So all that stuff is using up channels. So um, Wi-Fi is the easiest way to do it. But if you're streaming low-resolution video, that's you know that'll work. But if you start to go to high-resolution video, uh, Wi-Fi can get choked up pretty quickly, and your your available bandwidth can drop. So um, yes, that would be the absolute smartest way to do it is to stick it in the phone. Now, the 60 gig stuff, I, I like it personally because the wavelength of a signal is so small there that you can have multiple antenna arrays built onto a chip that's half the size 
of the nail on your pinky. It's a tiny little thing. And what that means is that if the signal is bouncing around the room at any given moment, if you're moving or something changes in the room, the receiver in the uh, 60 gig system can instantly pick the strongest signal, like a voting receiver, and you don't see any dropout or interruption with the signal. It just continues to, because there's a tiny little bit of buffering in there, but they claim the latency is less than one millisecond. That's the official specification. Yep. It also will bounce. So I can bounce a signal off a solid object, because as you say, 60 millimeter uh, or, or, or 60, 60 gigahertz, gigahertz millimeter waves. Yes, millimeter wave stuff, which by the way is the same frequency as the TSA scanners. When you put your hands over your head and they scan you, that's millimeter yeah. wave. Oh, um, I didn't realize that. Okay. It sure is. So uh, anyway, um, it, it will not go through solid objects, but it will bounce off objects, including people, furniture, walls, to get back to the receiver. I've tested it up to about 35, 40 feet reliably. Above that, it starts to fall apart. It mm -hmm. isn't really good for long range, but for home, makes a lot of sense. Now, within one within one room, I, I remember go, talking to the Psybeam guys when it first came out, and I and they said, well, sure, if you if you walk between the transmitter and the receiver, it will block the signal, but the the transmitter and receiver will immediately start looking for for other routes for the signal to bounce off walls or ceiling or whatever, and results in absolutely no um, interruption of the signal, which I thought was kind of cool. Yes, it's designed to do that. So last year at Infocom, I hosted an all-day session on what's going on with display interfaces, wired and wireless. And at one point, I hooked up, I had somebody come out of the audience and brought up their iPad. I put the iPad adapter on it into a prototype 60 gigahertz dongle. It was probably about yay big. Plugged it into the bottom and I walked around the room with it. And uh, when I put my hand over the end of it, the, obviously the transmission stopped. But literally the second I uncovered it, it resumed again. No hiccups. And I had people walk in front of it some distance away. I, I aimed it all around the room. Only when it was a solid object completely between the transmitter and the receiver did it drop out. So it does work exceptionally well. I think the thing that's holding people back is the cost. DVDO has something called the Air 3, Air 3 Plus. And I believe it's about $189, $169 for a transmitter or receiver. So again, that's the argument like, well, I'll just buy a cable. You know, I'm not going to spend that much money on a wireless. It has to be a lot lower in price for people to adopt it and it's got to be considerably lower in price for people to build it into a phone. But does it make does it make sense in a phone? Absolutely. Now one other thing to keep in mind, there's a new wireless uh, gigabit standard. It's 802.11ad as in Delta oh. and that operates in exactly the same channels. Worldwide I believe there are six channels available for these types of white space devices and I think four of them are concurrent to all areas of the globe. So uh, and these channels are about two gigahertz wide. So 802.11ad, wireless gigabit, or they call it certified wireless gigabit, can also operate on the same channels. Now a manufacturer might look into that and say, well, that's probably going to be cheaper than Psybeam. But again, you're back to TCP IP. You don't have a real-time protocol in there to ensure that the video and audio arrive in a precise order. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any products like that yet, but it might make perfect sense to install that in the house because it's a very short-range system, and it's probably going to be a lot more reliable than 802.11 uh, in the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz bands. So that area is very much Oklahoma territory up there, and you know what I mean by that. It's very unsettled, and nobody really knows what's going to happen. Nobody wants to miss out on an opportunity here, but they're saying, if I before I build that into a television or a phone or a tablet or any of these other devices, what's it going to do to the price of the device and who's going to use it? You know, does it is that a differentiator that somebody would pay more for in my system? And right now, we're seeing the lowest common denominator is to keep falling back onto regular Wi-Fi where the trend is to use channel bonding. So that would be 802.11ac, as in Charlie. And that means you can automatically bond uh, multiple channels, I think up to 160 megahertz, if they're available, to stream video to ensure that, this, that the signal gets through. And mm -hmm. I would guess that that's probably the way most people are going to go. But if you've ever tried the 60 gig stuff, you realize just how well it works and how, how superior it is anything else uh, that would be using that band or anything that's Wi-Fi based, it's a much better solution all around. Does uh, Psybeam or Amimon at the 60 gig or 5 gig uh, bands, uh, do they charge any kind of licensing? Yes, Amimon is a semiconductor company, so this is a proprietary technology that they developed. So uh, if I want to build a, uh, let's say a wireless kit, 5 gigahertz wireless kit, I can build it be built in China, which is where most of this stuff is being made, but I have to pay a royalty. I have to pay a license fee to Amamon to use the technology. Same thing with Psybeam. You have to pay a licensing fee because, again, it's, it's part of Lattice Semiconductor. It was really part of Silicon Image. So mm -hmm. those two technologies do require that you have to pay a license to use it, whereas anything based on Wi-Fi, you don't have to pay a license to use it. 
which is one reason why people are implementing Wi-Fi. Same question comes up with DisplayPort. I mean, if DisplayPort is less expensive because it has no license fee, um, why don't more TV manufacturers and other other companies that manufacture stuff uh, put DisplayPort in because it's going to be cheaper? Well, that goes back to that whole argument. And you'd be surprised, but TV manufacturers will argue over something that costs 50 cents to a dollar in a television. You know, yeah. they'll say, well, or even say five or 10 bucks and say, well, I can't afford to do that. You know, I, I can't spend that much money to put it in there. The reason that most of them haven't put DisplayPort in is they're not sure who's going to use it. And they're saying, well, that's going to add some cost to the TV. And of course, it's coming in as packet. So maybe they want to convert that. They have to convert that now to display driver, just as they have to convert TMDS to a display driver. And they're saying, why incur the additional cost if people aren't going to use it? So it was very forward thinking of Panasonic to put DisplayPort on their TVs. Uh, you know, if there's somebody that needed that higher bit rate to do 10-bit color, to do, you know, Ultra HD, whatever the reason was, or to work with a workstation. But the vast majority of TV manufacturers are looking at it and saying, who's going to use this? Does it, mm -hmm. What does it add to the cost of the TV? It's obviously not going to hurt me if I leave it off. So why should I even put it on there? But... In the world of computers and desktop monitors, they're absolutely having to support DisplayPort. They're acutely aware that computer workstation resolutions are getting higher and higher. Uh, the video cards, ATI and video, all the guys making the video cards are pushing the resolutions higher and higher. They're able to support it. I just got a press release today. I don't remember who it was from. I think it's BenQ. has a high refresh rate uh, gaming monitor, specifically for gaming. They claim they can do a refresh rate of 144 hertz with this thing. Well, you back if, if it's really true that they can do that and you back out of that and you want to run 4K into that, that's a heck of a lot of data to run through a display interface. Yeah. And right now, it's either one or two DisplayPort 1.2 interfaces that'll make it work. I mean, HDMI is not even a consideration. It's just too slow. Yeah. What about DRM? Web2207 in the chat room is asking about a DRM, HDCP, and Super MHL. And I wanted to ask about DRM also on DisplayPort, which... Uh, whether or not it, it, it could support that. Because, of course, the studios will insist upon some form of secure DRM uh, in order to support any of these. Yeah, well, the answer is that both standards support HDCP 2.2. They, they have to. They know that. They, they um, have to support that extra layer. They have to support the key exchanges. If you go on the Visa website, you look at DisplayPort or Google DisplayPort, and look at the FAQs, you'll see in there that the new version 1.3 supports HDCP 2.2 and Super MHL supports HDCP 2.2. They have to. They don't have any choice. They have to support it. If you don't support it, then you're automatically excluded. You'll never be considered as an interface for a TV or any other uh, device used for display consumer content. Got it. Blue Rules ask, um, does Super MHL uh, connector have some sort of locking device like DisplayPort or does it just slide right in? That's a good question. And you know what? I didn't think to ask him that. Um, does it lock? Uh, again, this is a very consumer-centric focus with this connector. So I'm assuming it's just going to slide in like HDMI. Uh, it, it, it's funny. In the commercial AV world, we want connectors that lock. We don't like connectors that can be pulled out easily. In the consumer right. world, people don't want connectors that lock. They want connectors that can be pulled out easily, even though they're going to probably hook them up once and never touch them again. So right. um, as far as I can tell, no, it does not lock. The other problem I have with HDMI connectors that don't lock is uh, on these really heavy-duty HDMI cables, like the one you mentioned that's as thick as your finger, uh, they're pretty heavy. And if the connector happens to be vertical and you're plugging it in like that, it could actually fall out. Correct. Well, there are several manufacturers that have um, HDMI connectors that have little ribs and things built into them that make a more secure connection. In the uh, commercial AV world, there's several people that make these, and they typically require about 12 pounds of pulling force to yank them out. I think the standard HDMI, bare bones HDMI connector, basic HDMI connector is about six pounds of pulling force. So um, there's ways you can do that without having to put screws on it. I mean, I've seen HDMI connectors with screws, but there are ways you can do this to ensure that the connector stays in. Um, I haven't used the really fat connectors a lot for that reason. I mean, that's obviously a big problem. Um, and in the pro AV world, a lot of people are doing HDMI over structured wire anyway. So they're coming out with a short cable going into a converter and then converting it to structured wire and then sending a structured wire up to about 328 feet, I think is the distance maximum for 1080p60. 
and at the receiver converting back to, let's say, a standard short HDMI interface. But you're right, it's a problem. And, and, and again, HDMI is not a connector that any commercial or professional application would ever have asked for or designed. They just never would have asked for it. It's, it's, it's not a good connector for them, but we have to live with it. It's what we have. So yeah. uh, we're, stuck, yeah. we're stuck with it. Okay, last question from Rusty Bones in the chat room. Um, if you were the king of the interface world, what would be your ideal situation? What, what would you like, what would be the best outcome of all of this stuff that's being developed? Plus king of the world, uh, I would probably go to 100% packetized system because the next step up from that is a pure packet delivery system direct to the TV. Um, so it would be an intermediate step. The nice thing about packets, once you're in the packet domain, it becomes very easy to compress. Number two, it becomes very, very easy to multiplex signals. You can pack all kinds of things into a display connector. You just have a fast enough bus speed to make it work. So that's one of the reasons I like the DisplayPort interface uh, is that it is a packet system. It took longer to develop it, but it was developed exactly with that in mind. Let's make it 100% digital. And that's why it's very easy for them to support native, uh, native driving over fiber optics. You may not be aware of it, but you can actually drive a display panel directly from DisplayPort. You don't have to convert from one format to another. You can go directly into the video drivers with the signal, and that's in the specification. It's easy for them to do wireless. So uh, we're all headed, ultimately, as uh, bandwidth increases, as networks get faster, we're headed to that direct video over IP structure running probably over fiber optics or something like it directly into the display device. But in the interim, a 100% packetized display interface, I think just makes more sense. You know, obviously HDMI, as, as, as Mike said earlier, and they've won. Well, they haven't really won. I mean, they haven't won the consumer space, but yeah, it's clearly they've won in the, uh, or they haven't won in the computer space, but they've won in the consumer space. But we're already having speed limit issues with it. We're looking ahead and saying the new version isn't fast enough. Super MHL may be fast enough. So um, I, I just think packets make more sense because that's just the way the world is nowadays. Everything is moving to packets, so why not make the display interfaces packetized? And that would mean DisplayPort or some variant thereof. Correct. Now, what's interesting about Super MHL is they say they support display stream compression. You can Google this also and read more about it. It's a very, very interesting way. It's a low uh, compression ratio. It's about 2 to 1 or 3 to 1, entropy-based. Um, it works. And the idea was that, you know, if we actually see 8K or things, that we can pack that down, maybe 50%, get that through some of these faster interfaces. So uh, the fact that Super MHL supports display stream compression is important because that will ensure that it has some shelf life. I have not seen any updates to the HDMI 2.0 standard to say that it will support uh, display stream compression. And at this point, again, why would I bother with HDMI 2.0 when I have Super MHL? Super MHL just makes more sense. So it's really hard to pick a winner in the horse race here. Um, Super MHL still uses TMDS. Obviously, DisplayPort is still packets. Uh, but I think long term, since uh, pretty much everything is moving to a packet-based system to do signal multiplexing, increase bit rates, and be able to do things like multicasting and all those other fun things associated with an IP network, that's where this is all going to go. So it's really, it's up to the manufacturers. They're the ones that will adopt it. They will say, I'll go with one or I'll go with the other or I'll go with both. You know, so what I think makes the most sense may not appeal to a manufacturer. They may just want to stay with what is tried and true and what people are buying. Well, let's hope the manufacturers listen to you. And I know a lot of manufacturers do listen to you. So uh, keep speaking out for uh, for what's what's right, what's the best thing to do. Keep fighting the good fight. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me on the show today. Uh, that's Pete Putman. Uh, he, is, uh, he can be found at his website, hdtvexpert.com. And I do recommend you go there because there's lots of great information. And Pete is obviously a very knowledgeable fellow, and I'm sure glad to, to have him on the show today. Uh, you can find me, of course, at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at htgeekscott and at avsforum. And you can always find previous episodes of Home Theater Geeks right here at twit.tv slash htg. And on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash twit home theater geeks. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be Juan Reyes, the CTO of Blue Focus, a uh, Blu-ray mastering house. And he's going to be talking to us about that process and also about the upcoming Ultra HD Blu-ray format and what he is thinking about now in preparation for that, which should be coming uh, by the end of this year. 
So I do hope you will join me for that. Should be a fascinating discussion. Until then, geek out.